Welcome to Egotopia U Media. I'm your host, Melissa McGinnis, joined by my co-host, Tom Wright. We are at the California Resource Recovery Association's 39th Annual Conference here in downtown Los Angeles. We have a wonderful special guest with us right now, John Davis. So nice to see you here in Los Angeles. Thank you. He's from the desert. Yes, he is. He's a desert rat, yes. The high desert. The high desert. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing here at this conference. Uh, well, I've been a part of CRA for I don't know, 30 years, so it's kind of a routine to come to the conference. Uh, this year I don't have a lot of responsibilities. I'm an advisor to the board, but I was at a meeting yesterday that ran long, so I missed the board meeting. I got there for dinner. Oh, okay. So I had dinner last night, worked out this morning, and then ran into Tom. Tom, when did the two of you meet? We met in, in different aspects. Uh, conference calls, the first time we met, I think, I was on a conference call with a group up in Sacramento. Um, John, give us some background. How did, how did you get into the, the recovery business? <laughs> uh, well, I started my career in city management a long time ago, uh, 1972. And after about five years in city management, I kind of began to specialize in community development, economic development, redevelopment work, um, and branched out to do consulting work. And I was asked by one of the former city managers that I worked with. What city were you talking? Victorville. What? Victorville. Victorville. Okay. Okay. Um, he asked me to take a look at the San Bernardino County landfill system that had just undergone a rate increase and they wanted to know whether that was an appropriate step. And it was, I, I describe it as like walking into a dark room uh, in an abandoned house and turning on the lights and things just started scurrying. There were, there were a lot of issues and it took about four years to resolve those landfill issues. In the meantime, the state had adopted AB 939 which put recycling obligations on cities and counties. For diversion. And so, yeah, so the, the work on the landfills had morphed into a regional effort involving 10 cities and the county. And um, we just began working together to develop the plans as part of AB 939, and then work together to develop programs and facilities to accomplish the recycling goals that we had set out. So it just became, <laughs> everything else went by the wayside and I began focusing on recycling. Are you are you from Victorville area? Or? I'm from Riverside. You're from I, I Riverside. In Riverside. And, uh, so I, most of my work uh, career has been in San Bernardino County across the, the county line. I started in Fontana and then went to Riverside and uh, now live up in the mountains in Oak Glen. In, in San Bernardino County. And San Bernardino County is the largest county in the state? Our, our area, I, I, so we formed a joint powers authority that's uh, nine cities and the county. It's 15,000 square miles. Wow. And, and about uh, 450,000 people. So it's, you know, there are pockets of the population and then there are large vacant And areas. the elevation ranges from? Um, well, the largest peak in Southern California, Mount Sagargonia, is 10,000 feet, and then Needles is close to sea level, a little, little bit on the Colorado River. So. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So before the, you guys got kind of, it pushed down to the cities and counties to do recycling and recovery, was there much of that going on in that area? <sighs> It, it was hard to tell. It, yeah, every city went out and tried to figure out what was going on. We didn't find much. Mm -hmm. um, but about, about 2005, 2004, 2005, stores started collecting their material and uh, their cardboard and selling it. There was a big price jump for cardboard because of the, the Chinese markets. And uh, so things began to take off. Um, I guess it was, it was earlier than that, it was early, probably 2000. Um, and, and prior to that, no, we weren't, we weren't seeing a lot of uh, uh, voluntary recycling. There weren't opportunities. Traditional things like auto bodies, appliances, uh -huh. you know, steel, scrap dealers, they were around there, but not the other materials. So bottles and cans because of the deposit system, but paper, plastic, not really. It's a really um, short amount of time to really to. You're, I know you're getting an award here this this annual um, event, the 39th annual 
year and I'm sorry, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Or can you cut me out? Okay, thanks. Um, so what I was saying was I think that's really a short amount of time to get to where you're at today to have this distinguished award going to you. <laughs> John, John, by the way, is getting the Recycler of the Year Award from CRRA. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's... Wait, in 25 wait, years. Wait, that's, that's so you, you say that moniker fits you the, as a recycler, at least the moniker is a recycler for 25 years? Yeah, okay. yeah that's, that's pretty much what I've been doing for the last 25 years. I'm not sure what I'll be doing the next 25. But, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is a Lifetime Achievement Award. It's the second Lifetime Achievement Award I received from CRA. So the first one, I was just a kid. I was 60 years old, you know, the crazy dream. And uh, now, eight years later, I get another one, and you know. So now I've got two lifetime achievements and more. Just I don't know what the implications of that are. Well, you're the more cat. You're the how cat. Many more lifetimes. Yeah, you got, you got you got <laughs> seven still more work to do. Yeah, so seven, guess, seven more to yeah, do. I guess yeah. I'm not done yet. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's really impressive. Many, the man of many lives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's and there's more to do. You know, we're we're uh, we're entering. Uh, a pretty exciting time for the next five years in California. We expect to, the, the state wants to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions back to 1990 levels by the year 2000 and recycle 75% of what there is created in the state by the year 2000. So in the next five years, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of changes. Wow. And then we go beyond that. So. Where do you see food waste recycling for the state of California? Well. Um, I'm in the process of finishing the negotiations to put a food composting facility at the recycling facility in Victorville. Um, it'll be the first time that we've really entered into uh, municipal collection of compostable material. There's no, there, there's not the traditional lawns out there in landscape to support green waste recycling that's been going on. So, you just the cacti, huh? Yeah, with people, <laughs> actually, they're, they're, when, when I worked out there in the 70s, there were no lawns. And then uh, some of the grass hybridizers managed to get grass to grow out there. It's, it's very extreme conditions. It can be 110 in the summer, uh -huh. 25 in the winter. And so Annual far, rainfall, yeah, approximately three, four inches. Three or four inches, wow. So, so uh, and, but now the, now the uh, water authorities are asking people to remove, they're paying to remove lawns. And so the few lawns that were there are disappearing again. But, but food's the big, the, the big one. And, uh, uh, the facility that we're going to put at the recycling facility, it's a publicly owned recycling facility in Victorville, and so we're working in tandem with a private operator who, to put in a, a food composting facility. They received one of the first five greenhouse gas incentive grants from the state of California for that facility. So um, it's, it's not the old kind of open windrow commercial compost facility that you might be familiar with. It's a, it's, it has a cover over it made by Gore, the, the Gore-Tex. Oh, you're doing the Gore-Tex yeah. system, which, yeah. it, and you're doing aeration. it on the tracks, tracks and everything? Yeah, well, it's on an aeration. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah on, on an aeration system. So it's a, it's a really clean uh, system, reduces odors. You know, the, the incoming material will all be processed inside a building. And so, you know, we're trying to address it like a 21st century solution to, to a problem rather than some old It sounds <laughs> some like it. Approaches. Do you have any sense of what you'll do with your end product when you're done? Well, uh, you know, there's always agricultural markets. Um, that seems to be the dominant market and the fallback market. We're, we're starting to educate people uh, on some of the other options like erosion control. Um, there's, a, there's a real lack of uh, infrastructure for storm drainage when, when we do get storms, and, and uh, particularly along the river course. And so you will know, we'll be looking at erosion control. There's also a lot of mines in the area that need to be reclaimed. And Victor Valley College has uh, done research. Which is a junior college? Yeah. Okay. yeah, they have an agricultural program. Got it. And so we've been working alongside them for the last seven or eight years in anticipation of someday using the compost to help reclaim the mines out there. So you know, we'll, we'll see where the, where the markets are. Um, we don't have an agricultural base, really. And, and so I don't, I don't see people. There, there's pistachio growers, but that's pretty much it. Do you, do you have any idea of 
about your feedstock, what do you allow? In other words, will you allow uh, food service ware that comes in, uh, paper plates, um, uh, would, uh, biopolymers are allowed? Yeah, yeah, I think I think we're going to focus on the, the squishy stuff first. The uh, wet stuff. The wet, the wet stuff. It's it's about a 60-40 mix optimally, so we, we still need the landscape material that's out there. So it needs it's a yard, straight, a, a brown, br some people refer to the green and brown mix. Yeah, yeah there's two, you know, the compostable where it, it, I think it's just too iffy. Most, most, yeah, places can accept it if it really is what they think it is. But if it's how, truly certified yeah, compostable. Yeah, but how, how do you, when, it, when it's crossing over the line heading into the compost facility, who knows what, what it is. So if you can control the source, then you can control the product coming out when the source is coming from, you know, a hundred different commercial generators into one facility. But the likelihood is that some of that stuff is not going to break down, and then it's in the finished compost. We'd like to avoid that. How how would you suggest you could control it if it's coming in with all those different places? Well, obviously, one approach: the state ban plastic bags. Uh, the state legislature it's going to go to an initiative next year. If that goes through, then we're not going to see uncompostable plastic bags at least coming out of the, in the frequency that we see them now. So, I suppose. I <laughs> some, see. I mean, some enterprising legislator could say no more I, plastic utensils. She has a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I see like at supermarkets or Whole Foods, if you will, you know, they suggest this, this, and this, and sometimes I think it's wrong. Like they are miseducating on what's compostable and what's not. And if you're getting that compost, like, do you control it by sorting at the facility? You know, I mean, uh, uh, I, we have not. First of all, understand we have not reached the level of talking about what we're going to accept or not, but we talk about how we might <laughs> reach that. Well, level. I'm so just I thinking in I terms of give you a real answer. yeah, how you're going to collect it because yeah. for one, it seems like film com certified compostable <laughs> film yeah. is a good way to collect food scraps. Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's that's a, so. But but the the problem is on a on a community scale controlling all the different sources. It's really difficult, you know, I, I, and I think education is key. I think we just yeah. need to keep getting education out yeah. there and out there. And um, how important is a food waste recycling program for the state of California's initiative to cut down greenhouse gases? Oh, it's it's the most important thing that we do in in our group by far. Uh, uh, the state just issued uh, a draft strategy to control short-lived climate pollutants. And short-lived climate pollutants are, are uh, not carbon dioxide, they're CFCs, methane, um, uh, carbon black, they're, they're, they leave the atmosphere in a short period of time and have a much greater impact when they're in the atmosphere. So, you know, not to give all Technical on I mean, greenhouse no, gas no, measurements, but methane, methane, no, it's what we're methane here for. when it's please be technical. Methane. Okay, well, I'll be technical for a moment. <laughs> so, so there's something called a global warming potential, and, and methane is converted to the equivalent of carbon dioxide in most inventories and measurements. So, methane is said to be 21, 23, 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So, for clarity for our viewers, methane is produced in the landfill when food waste is breaking down, and it's one one of the largest contributors to global warming. It, it's, it's, yeah, methane is created in an airless, um, a dark airless environment with water, which is a landfill. <laughs> Landfills are designed to create methane. Or, or, <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, yes. Um, and then, but, but most not purposely. Just to be clear, just to be clear, to the audience said, "Lanzo, the, the, he, what he's clarifying <laughs> is what happens in a landfill. It's not, it's not that they were designed to create greenhouse gases." But go ahead. Some may, some may argue with that. <laughs> I, I some that have figured out how to capture it, maybe. But yeah, yeah they yeah. capture part of it, and, that, well, and that's part of the end. That's part of the, the issue with landfills. But, but, but aren't they capturing it way too late in the process? Yeah, they, they don't capture all of it. In other words, 15% slept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 20, 15, 25 or more. Yeah. Uh, but, but nonetheless, the, the, the methane is normally expressed in terms of carbon dioxide as 21 times, 23 times, 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Methane actually, and, which mean, and carbon dioxide lasts in the atmosphere for 100 years. Methane lasts in the atmosphere for 12 years, and during that 12-year period, it's 72 times more potent than carbon dioxide. 
if if we stopped creating methane today, it would it would leave the atmosphere within 12 years. There would be no more methane in the atmosphere. The the state of California estimates that you can control the if if we <laughs> humans on Earth control the short light greenhouse gases, we can reach uh, uh, minimize the warming potential to about two degrees over the next 50 years, which is kind of the benchmark for not having huge catastrophic feedbacks. So removing methane is a big deal. California is one of the first <laughs> one of the first entities to to try to, uh, to to try to control methane as methane. And and when you when you look at methane as methane, yeah, it's a, it's a big contributor maybe four or five percent in a lot of inventories. When you look at methane as methane, it's more like 12 to 15 percent. Because it's a stronger... It's a, it's a much bigger impact, and getting it out of the atmosphere in the short term is much more beneficial. Well, I'm so glad that the state of California is figuring out that that's a big contributor, and then they've got you on the job to solve it, Mr. <laughs> Double Lifetime Achievement Award winner. So if anyone's here for California, it's you. We, it's no wonder you're getting the award, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, It's John. a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.